progress. Oh, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's me. There we go. No, I don't think. I don't no, think. I it must be a new update. It must be a new update because it just started, what, last week? Was last it? Week. Week, I think? Yeah. Do we have to consent? No, it just says continue. It's just one of them things that just. Oh. You know, so everybody knows, I guess. So everybody knows that unless you got. Okay. They're being recorded. Watch what you say. No, just, <laughs> just kind of them things. It's being recorded. And if you got a problem, if you don't like that or something, adjust it or. But, uh, Anyway, no one's wanted, and if we're online, anyone's going to say, hey, I know them, and get in trouble. <laughs> Just doing Bible study that people can tune in, and uh, welcome those that tune in and check it out. Uh, that is the advantage of doing it online, that if you record it, what we say here and what goes on, and people can tune in and listen and learn some Bible and uh, be ministered to in their way as well. They just can't interact with us. So um, just one of them things, it's good and bad. Uh, good that they can hear, good they can learn. Bad is they can't interact and ask questions unless they call the church and say, hey, we want to know about that. But um, <laughs> it's good. So we've been talking about Isaiah and we got to Isaiah, the woes. We talked about the woes of you know Isaiah speaking about and challenging other people uh, in the first uh, few chapters, the woes of judgment coming upon Israel and its people uh, because of their sinfulness, because of their idolatry, because of those things of turning away from God. And, and now tonight, and we looked at uh, a little bit of chapter six uh, last week. And here, uh, Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 6 is where we're going to be in, and I'm going to throw a couple other uh, scriptures out to us tonight, depend, again, depending on how far we get, to help us, um, again, grow into where God wants us to be. Hopefully tonight we'll learn some new things about um, us being used by God, because chapter 6, Isaiah, King Isaiah died, right? That's what it says, uh, the scripture says, you know, King Uzziah has died, and Isaiah is going into the temple. He is going to worship, and he's in the temple. And if you remember, um, Uzziah possibly was Isaiah's cousin. Um, possibly. Some commentators believe, but they're really good friends. And, uh, you know, of course, Uzziah, toward the end of his reign, he too turned his, you know, he did, he turned his back upon God and uh, he got prideful. His armies that he built, he felt, you know, that was his power. Uh, again, not realizing God built those things. Uh, but now Isaiah, he's in the temple and um, he's in the presence of God uh, because uh, there again, as he said, uh, in chapter 6, it says, in the, year, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And it talks about what he's seen. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two... <coughs> <clears throat> they were flying and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now imagine you seeing that when you came into church on Sunday. Tell me, that wouldn't rock your world. Um, now, now, we can feel the presence of God in the sanctuary. I mean, we go to worship God, where's the Holy Spirit's there. Uh, just sometimes you're going to feel it more than others because you feel more in tune with God. Um, and then there's this experience at the sound of their voices, the doorpost uh, and the threshold shook and the temple was filled with smoke. 
And I guess it doesn't say how many serifs either, does it? No. They just had each of them had six wings. So how many? Yeah. It doesn't say how many, but each of them had six wings. Two, four, six. Being humble, couldn't look upon God and uh, but praising him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And can you imagine, I mean, what that was like at the sound and the shook of uh, the temple. So the first six chapters, the first five, basically, Isaiah is woe to other people, right? That's what he is preaching. His message was woe to you. He's looking at other people and their sinfulness. You know, God's given him this word to speak to them against the nation of Israel about their sinfulness, about their idolatry, about uh, their turning from God. Woe are you. And so now he is, uh, what's his response there in uh, verse five? Woe to me. Yeah. Through him seeing the Lord and, and God's holiness uh, kind of gives him a new understanding or thinking about himself. And for the first time in his life, maybe Isaiah saw himself as God saw him. Because Isaiah, if he's like the rest of us, uh, he probably thought of himself as a good godly man or woman especially when he compared himself to people like King Uzziah and others that he spoke to. But in the presence of God, we see his message of woe to others became woe to me. Uh, and so sometimes we can see ourselves like that. It's interesting, a quote uh, that this author put and has in here, and he says, uh, the subject is, until we see ourselves as useless, we really aren't usable. Isaiah had to learn his need for cleansing. So... What is the significance of when God asked, who shall I send? In verses eight, in light of what happened in verse seven. So read, let's read verse seven and eight. Someone want to read that for us? With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. So what came first? What do we see as the significance of God asking, Whom shall I send? I guess volunteering is service, life. I don't know what else you want to include in that. Well, what's the first thing that what happened in verse 7, though? Oh, he was oh. cleansed. Yeah, the ceremonial, because if we go back, I guess I should have read 4, or, or, or I mean, the rest of 5, because he says, Isaiah's words in verse 5, woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. God, right? Old Testament, I see God, I see the face of God, I'm gonna, he's gonna die. Uh, but for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So he thought he was done. He's like realizing who he was. I'm a, I live among a man. I am a man of unclean lips. I live among, among people of unclean lips, and I've seen God. And so then, then we see that the, the seraphim flew to him with a live coal in his hand. 
uh, and touched his lips. So that, that cleansing, sin is dealt with, realizing who he was. He was humbled. And now that the sin is dealt with, forgiveness is given. What comes next? So he's usable now. Because sometimes we're not usable until we be realize the sin in our lives to be asked for forgiveness. Then the Holy Spirit can move and we're ready to, to serve the Lord. Um, because we're not, it's interesting. And sometimes we're not usable sometimes as saints until we realize and become dependent sinners. In other words, dependent on God, depending on his forgiveness. Um, because God has, God has to do a work in us sometime before he can do a work through us. You ever think of that? He's got to do a work in us before he can do a work through us. Before he can work through us because of, like Isaiah. Isaiah needed to be, his, his focus of his ministry needed to change uh, to get fresh eyes on who he thought he was and realizing, man, I'm, I'm as bad, I'm as bad as the people I'm preaching to. I need forgiveness, not as bad, but he's, he compares us. I think he's better, but he needs to be humbled so he can, God can use him uh, to change his focus. So he's looking too much on himself rather than uh, seeing who he is in God. Uh, and realizing he needs God to, to help him. Um, so what's Isaiah's new task? What's he supposed to do? Um, what does the Lord call him to do? Verses, uh, was it verses 9 and 10? Because verse 8 says... He heard the voice and he said, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And then he says, I said, here I am, send me. Here am I, send me. So what's verses 9 and 10 say? Do you want to read them? He said, go and tell this people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of this people calloused. Make their ears dull and close their eyes. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Wow. Isn't that interesting? So what's his message? He's giving him a message and who's gonna listen? Nobody. Nobody. Yeah. Yeah. He's giving him a message. He's giving Isaiah a message. Uh, and no one listened. Now, uh, in Matthew 13, little New Testament, Jesus speaking of why he spoke in parable. Uh, Matthew 13. I had it here. 13, 14, and 15. Matthew 13, 14, and 15. Yeah. It's the same words. Yeah. See that? 14, 13, 14, and 15. He uses uh, some of the same words. Um, In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. Um, Mark 4.12 
Um, verse 13, he said, or verse 11, he told them, uh, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those who the outside, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parable so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. And then Luke 8, 10. In other words, in a different way, his disciples asked him what, what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you but to others I speak in parables so that though seeing, they may not see, though hearing, they may not understand. Um, I think the other was John, John 12, 40 talks about, um, yeah, John taught, uh, 40, 12, 40 says, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can ne neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. And so, why didn't God want to heal his people? Does that make sense? Do you think he didn't want to heal them? That's a tough question. Um, again, God's a sovereign. So, not, not being able to have the mind of God, but understand the total understanding of God, but yet knowing that here, God is putting this message out in Isaiah, and the people are not understanding it. They're not listening. And how many hundred years later, they're still not understanding. Yeah. And God's purpose uh, it required judgment on Israel. I mean, I guess so long he's tells you, tells you, tells you, and people don't listen. Uh, again, he's a holy God, and judgment comes. Uh, God's a just judge. And they couldn't say they didn't, weren't warned. You know what I mean? It's one of those things that Israel couldn't say, well, you didn't tell us. <laughs> how many years, I mean, I, I, exactly how many years this is, but years before Isaiah and Isaiah's message Straighten up, get right, get back with God, or else. Um, and that's, as we look back at this and we see this going on, as, as Rick said, we see this going on in Isaiah's time. He went out and he spoke this message. And to think about it, um, how long, well, let's just see this. Um, According to verses 11 to 13, would I, how long would he preach this message? As long as it takes. Yeah, because what's it say there? Read, read verses 11 to 13. What does it say? And I said, for how long, O Lord? And he answered, until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitant, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. But as the terebinth and oak leave stumps when they are cut down, so the holy seed will be the stump in the land. I'm not sure if that, that, is, that okay, talks about Jesus coming because out of the stump of Jesse, 
is going to come out. So that that could be some of that as well. Um, and they have nothing else left. They will listen. Pretty much is what it says. Yeah. So it's, it's, um, and that's sometimes what we do. Yeah. We have to hit rock bottom before we'll listen. What does the first part of verse 13 in your passage? I wasn't listening close enough. I'm sorry. What does 13? It, yeah, 13. And though a tenth remains in the land, it will again be laid waste. Okay. So a tenth. So there's a remnant. What do you think that the significance of the remnant means or the tenth? What is there a significance in that, do you think? I guess you could call Noah and his family remnants. Okay. Okay. And there seems to be always a remnant of people who will follow God in the midst of whatever. Hopefully, we are a part of that remnant. Uh, you know, when it comes to push to shove, uh, persecution, trials, um, to continue to follow God. Um, and there had to be a remnant, or else we wouldn't be today. There wouldn't be a nation of Israel. And so that remnant is there, it's just. Uh, we're studying God's word tonight to hopefully make us strong enough in our walk and our faith that we continue on to be part of a remnant, to be in the midst of things, to turn people back and around to God, um, that that remnant stay faithful. Um, in the midst of culture, in the midst of life around us, that we stand on the word of God and stay faithful. And, um, Again, like Isaiah, he, and all these prophets, but Isaiah that we've been studying, he preaching God's word, woe to you people. And then all of a sudden he realized he got a little far off. But the neat thing is in his worship, he found, he met God in the tabernacle, in, in the temple. And God just, you know, showed himself to him, which was really great. Um, and so instead of running, he said, woe to me and confessed his sin. And the cherubim touched his lips. And now what's new? He got repented and became, my first words to say, on fire for the Lord. Not just because he got a cold touch his lips, but he got, you know, what am I going to do? I'm cleansed now. And a lot of times that's, we need to get to that point sometimes. Like uh, Julie said about you hit rock bottom or, you know, we think we're doing well, but then God puts a scripture in our minds or a time of worship and the Holy Spirit reminds us or challenges us to think about something in our life that we need to take before God. We ask him to forgive us, be repentant, and the spirit fills us and energizes us again. Uh, here am I. Send me. Uh, where? What? Either missions or just in the church, in the body, to be challenged to minister, to use gifts and talents to serve him. So um, how would you, so then how would we gauge the effectiveness of Isaiah's ministry then? God gives you that no one's going to listen to. It's doomed for failure just to get started. I mean, there's the fact that it's all written down in the Bible. Okay. I guess a lot of people say he was, what, the greatest Old Testament prophet. Yeah. How do you think God looks at your ministry? Each one of you have ministries. You have you have gifts, talents, and things to do. So, um, 
Because how do how do we evaluate? Them? How do we evaluate our own? Yeah, our uh, own. Or just come back to, or just come back to how do we evaluate ministry? How do we evaluate? Um, how would you evaluate it? Because um, sometimes we we look at the the the, the word the, the word used lately is scorecard. The scorecard looks different from. Some people think, well, you got a big church, or you got a big Sunday school class, or you got this ministry is big, and it's, there's a lot of people coming. Um, do we? A lot of times we evaluate ministries by how many, right? Nickels yeah. and noses. Yeah. And sometimes we don't think we're doing much because we don't have much of a what we think of as a following, maybe, or a uh, impact impact yeah 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 there's people in the church that think well who am i right i don't do much can we actually evaluate anyone's ministry wouldn't well, that be up to god well i'm asking that very question today <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's what it's about. That's... They just put it in different words. Okay. <laughs> but, but really, how would you evaluate? How do you evaluate Isaiah's ministry whenever he did? Oh my God, boy. But how did he work? What did he do? Did he change God's word? Did he change the message to get a bigger following? Mm. No. No, he just spoke God's word even knowing that he's going to fall on deaf ears. So his basically in real life, like we would sit back and go, well, you want a very profitable prophet, right? But in real life, though, his obedience to the purpose of God was successful. He didn't give up. Right. He didn't give up um, and he continued to, God measures our effectiveness by how our works align with his purpose. So if, if you're aligned with God's purpose, you know, what, what he calls us to do, um, you know, because the ministry of Isaiah was greatly effective for he fulfilled the purpose of God for his life. And thousands of years later, you know, we are still ministered to and by the life and message of, of Isaiah. We're reading it today, and we're being ministered to it. So to reach the purpose of God, we must die to our own agendas and our own ambitions. Dying to self is a small sacrifice for only the purpose of God brings eternal fruit. Everything else is wood, hay, and stubble. So we do things for the purpose of God. Not necessarily for ourselves, not necessary for our glory, not but, but for his glory, his purposes, his agenda. That's where the eternal fruit come from. Right? That's where uh, Jesus talked about where your treasures are in heaven. Um, 1 Corinthians 3, 12 and 13. Before you read that, I'm going to read Isaiah 5, 24. Therefore, a tongue of fire licks up straw and as dry grass sinks down in the flames, so their roots will decay and their flowers blow away like dust. For they have rejected the law of the Lord 
Almighty and spurred and, and spurned the word of the Holy One of Israel. So, what's 1 Corinthians 3, 12 and 13 say? Does somebody have that? So verse 3, 12 and 13? No, no chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 3, 12 and 13. Okay. 12 and 13. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. Okay. That's our plumb line. To look at each one of our own hearts and our lives and the God's purpose for us. God's purpose in our lives. Are we fulfilling it? Uh, whether the world thinks we're successful or not. Uh, and sometimes that's a struggle, maybe in our, in our present experience, that there's an issue that we struggle with. Um, but to understand, put it in perspective that you're being obey, obedient to God and a part of his purpose is what you're doing for him and his kingdom. And what you're able to do. Because there's a lot of, there's some people out there today, um, I think of you know, shut-ins or disabled people and some things that they can't get to church or they can't do some things they used to do, uh, but they feel led. And, and I believe God puts on their heart to pray, to have a prayer ministry, to be intercessors and, and praying for the church and praying for different ministries that they see in, in bulletins or they're heard about, you know, and they might not feel like there's very, they're not very successful, but that is a success of being obedient to the purpose of God in your life. And that might be being a prayer warrior and praying for people. You might not see success or hear about success, but in the spiritual realm and the things, that's a success. Just being obedient to the purpose of God, uh, fulfilling different ministries uh, that you don't, you don't get a, a pat on the back a lot, or you don't get a at a boy or not a girl. Um, so you kind of get down. But if you're doing what God wants you to do and calls you to do, that's a purpose of God. That's a success. Um, and that's a bigger part of the church that we don't see and need to understand about. Um, that's a very important part. And then the other side of all this is, are there, um, like King Uzziah, Isaiah looked at him as, I am not as bad as. Do we do that? Are there, are there Uzziahs in our lives that we tend to look at and think that ourselves as more godly than them? And then that sometimes, excuse me, that keeps us from seeing God because we don't think we are in that bad of shape. So, um, to understand, the one thing that changed Isaiah in his ministry here is when he came face to face with God and he seen God high and lifted up. That high and lifted up um, was a a game changer. In other words, coming face to face and realizing who God is. Uh, because we have trouble seeing ourselves accurately um, until we see God accurately, our Lord accurately, high and lifted up and bringing us humble before him so that we can be used of him. Because we need to, we need to think about that, and, and you know, what is our view of God? Do we see God as God, a holy and just God, a heavenly Father, and wanting to use us and move in our lives, high and lifted up? God is God above all else, above all things. Uh, or do we bring them down to? our level. It's 
something to think about. Because uh, what will we do if we've seen God? <laughs> I mean, just think of Isaiah. If we, um, the coming into his presence, the coming into uh, worship with an idea of seeing God or feeling God or knowing he's there, realizing he is there uh, in his presence, um, what is our what is our view of God? Do you have a view of God? I hear the wheels turning. <laughs> Do you have a view? What is your view of God? How would you voice that? It's hard to voice, isn't it? Yeah. What is your view of God? I don't know if this is what you mean, but first of all, he's creator. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um someone I can spill my heart out to that isn't going to criticize or, you know, find fault with what I'm saying, think I'm crazy or whatever. <laughs> Just always there. He's always there. Okay. Okay. Ever present. Ever present. I guess you could say forgiving. Forgiveness? Forgiving God? Forgiving. Yeah. He's a forgiving God. I mean, that, our, our, our view of God and understanding who he is sometimes it blurs with our humanness of understanding who he is. I mean, he is God. He's God Almighty. He can do whatever he wants. Uh, but he loves us enough to send his son to die for us. And, um, and even in the midst of things going on around us, he is still, like Julie says, he's there. Uh, does that help us think about our purpose then in life? I'm still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> Well, again, day by day, there again, spending time with God and hearing from him and then being the, the best disciple of Jesus we can be. Uh, it might change sometimes, too, our purpose, like where we are in our life. Tomorrow, your purpose might be to you put someone in your way in your life, in your direction to do something that your purpose is to be you in the midst of, of that, to be Jesus to somebody in a way that he blesses you uh, or a purpose of ministering in areas uh, that, again, your gifts, your time, your talents, um, what God gives you, what you have to give to God, to offer to him. Who am I? Who am I going to send to these people? Who am I going to send? And you have the opportunity to go, here am I, Lord, send me. Uh, and it's kind of hard to get a, to put a high um, view of God without becoming aware then of our own sinfulness. Because sometimes we don't put two God, got God up there real high, and which he belongs up there. And it's like, wow, then I'm a, look at our sinfulness and for us then to turn to him as Isaiah did and get cleansed and then to hear from what he has to say. So huh. victory is not you overcoming sin. Victory is Jesus overcoming you. Interesting. Is that in your study Bible or one of their 
One of theirs. Yes, yeah, not one. No. no. I can't take credit for those kind of things. Not that one anyway. <laughs> but victory is not you overcoming sin. Victory is Jesus overcoming you. So he overcomes us. And what would that be like? Jesus in us, overcoming us. That's how we can overcome the sin is through Christ overcoming us, putting on his righteousness and becoming like him. Uh, basically. Because uh, there's an issue, I have this thing, it is, uh, there's a cycle. There's a cycle to everything. There's a cycle to addiction. There's a cycle. There's a cycle to sin. Um, because, and it's a Daryl, it's sometimes you get in this spin that you get, you have the sin and then you got guilt, right? Because sin brings guilt. And the guilt is the part where Satan condemns, um, where God convicts, the Holy Spirit convicts. But then you come around and you vow, you make a vow, oh, oh you know, I ain't never going to, I'm not going to do this again. I'm going to try harder. And then what happens is you try harder and you come back to sin. The guilt, the vow, I'm not going to do it. Try harder. So there's something missing in that cycle. And it's called surrender. Um, and basically surrender is giving the Holy Spirit the complete control in that area of our lives. There again, that's that Jesus overcoming uh, to give us that complete access to your life. Uh, when faced with temptation, if we immediately surrender to God rather than trying harder to resist the temptation, his power will carry us safely through. So that's why a lot of times people without Jesus, they're trying to break a cycle and I can't break it. And it gets frustrating and just deep down, deep down, and then it gets that cycle. If you don't let Jesus in, because you might, even, there, there's Christians out there that, try harder, but they don't let the Holy Spirit, they don't let God in. They don't let the Spirit have control. They want to try to control it. They want to try to fix it. And that's that cycle. It keeps on going until you get God, let God break through. You have to let the Holy Spirit break through. Woe is me, for I am. And you can fill in the blank. And then allow the spirit to have control of that area of your life. That's anywhere. I mean, it happened with me for cigarettes. I would have never quit smoking cigarettes if it wouldn't have been for God. I'd have just kept on smoking. I'd have tried, because I did try. I tried the last cigarette. Go get another pack of cigarettes. I'm not going to open it. I'm going to stick his pack of cigarettes in my pocket. And I'm just going to pretend they're there and they're going to help me. And I just won't open it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Light them up. It wasn't until, and it was before, uh, well, I'll just share it. It's live. I don't care. Um, it was right before I joined, I went to seminary. It was a Sunday morning. Uh, it was the night, a couple days before that. I just like, man, this is crazy. How do I? God just brought the conviction or he just brought it on me. You know, he's like, you're silly. What are you still doing this for? And so it was at the church service. Uh, I went down front after service. They had a time of open altar kind of thing and they did a thing. And I went down front and God just laid it out for God. I said, I just, here they are. I can't do this. Help me take this from me. And I gave them to him and I haven't smoked a cigarette since. That's like 24 years or so. Anyway, oh, long time. But praise God. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't have quit. And I know there's people out there going, ah, you're just weak. I quit cold turkey. Well, that's good. God gave you that 
It still comes from God. I don't care where you think about it, but still God gave you that ability to do it that way. But there's things in people's lives, sin issues in that, that you continue the cycle, addiction or whatever, and until you allow God to break in, they just keep spiraling down with those things. And maybe you've done it in your life. I'm not for the confessions, but if you look at your life and the things that you struggled with, it wasn't until that cycle was broken by God, broken by giving things, surrender to God, that He took it from you, or you gave it to Him. Um, an area of your life you don't do it no more because He changed you. You allowed Him to change you because you couldn't change yourself. <laughs> and recognizing our sinfulness really is then recognizing our need for God. Recognizing the sinfulness, the issues, the thing, the spiraling that I'm going through, that you go through this, how much more that we need, our need is for God. And if we're not living our lives of dependent dependence in our walk, in our ministry, we probably don't see our needs because we're not looking at God. If we don't look at God, we look at ourselves. We don't think we need anything. We think things are going good, but really just think how much more better they would be if they would be with God and involved in them and with us. So just think about these things. This is, this is something for you to go, hmm, and just think about, okay, how much dependent am I? How dependent am I on God, and how dependent am I on me? And are there areas in my life, in my ministry, that I need to depend more on God and less on me? There's a song out there that says, more of you, less of me. Um, talking about Jesus. I need more of need more of him in me. You need people to see more of him and less of me. Um, and uh, so we see Isaiah. Here am I, send me. He's seen that because he came in the, the presence of God. His, his view of God changed. And then so did the view of himself change. And then God said, go. And I believe that's what he wants to do with us. Uh, just to be willing to use to be used by God and be open to what um, he has for us uh, to serve him, whatever that might be. And not to look at, and I pray that we don't do this, that any, any church, that each ministry that is as is, is important as the other one, everything from uh, mopping floors to greeters, to evangelism, to all other ministries is all needed because we all have gifts. We all have gifts and abilities that God has bestowed upon the body of Christ, right? And so the body is the body and it's many members, diverse groups of people for one reason, to come together to glorify God. When we get the idea who God is, we see who our need for him. Yeah. And the more we let of him, okay. the more he'll use us. Good. And we get to that point of here am I. Questions, comments? Because we're going through this right now. I think some of this we're going through right now. There's times in the new church, in the not in the new church, but in the church after COVID. And there's ministries that we're doing. And it doesn't seem to be much fruit to them. Right? Because people wasn't coming out. They're not attending. So we don't have big numbers. Were they not good then? Do you quit? No. God's calling us to do something. We do it. And we do it the best of our ability. 
and we see where he wants us to go, how he wants us to continue to perform and do those ministries, those outreaches, those different things to do them and allow him to add the increase. We remain faithful. His purpose, he will add the fruit. We might have to change some things, but there again, as he's in control and each person doing a, working toward their purpose and vision of life, um, we'll see things happen. Uh, we're willing to stay the purpose. Even in your area of what you're doing for the Lord, it might not, well, who am I? Well, he says you are who, his, his child. And to serve him and to, as you say, here am I. And he says, this is where I'm sending you. This is what you're doing. We stay obedient. His glory is lifted up. Are we willing? That'd be a prayer focus of ours to God, where you want to send me? Um, who do you want to send me to? Kind of thing. How do you want to use me? Uh, help us get an idea of who God is in our lives and depend on him and see what he's going to do. Changed Isaiah's life. It can change ours as we get closer to God and walk with him. It takes time, though. It takes time to be real with him and take that time just to hang in there. See what, just hear what God has to say. And the ministry that we're doing, that we stay faithful to them in the midst of circumstances around us. And maybe he's saying change. Change your delivery. Keep your pitch. Never change the pitch. Never change the, 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 the gospel. You always change. You don't change the gospel. It always needs to be a strike. But the strike might come as a curveball. The strike might come as a change up. It's always the gospel. But here am I. How does he want to use you? How does he wants to use me in the coming days for his glory and for his message to be spoken about? So that's Isaiah. <clears throat> kind of like us. It's interesting to see the prophets and to look at what was going on in the Old Testament to see. Hey, they're not much different than we are. Praise the Lord, we got Jesus and the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us and help us. Technology like this to come together. So be anxious to see this summer as you pray through this on what ministries and what purposes God's going to be calling us to. As we seek his direction and with different things he'll reveal to each one of us. Any take on that? Any what do you got? What do you think? Got some thoughts you want up there? I'm just totally Quiet group. <laughs> Got everybody's brain on overload to try to what am I doing? Yeah. So take it to the other day. Speaking of that, who do we need to pray for? 